I love eating desserts, and I always treated it as uh, you know a form of food. And at the time, I don't know everybody thought of it that way. I think everybody pretty much thought it was a kind of indulgence or an occasional treat um, or or something that's just wild and you know something that's not part of like a daily diet. But you know, I grew up in a culture where you can really eat dessert at any time of the day. You're listening to the Taste Podcast. I'm editor in chief Matt Rodbard. Here with senior editor Anna Hiesel. On today's show, Matt talks to Piché Ong, a legend in the New York City pastry game and currently the pastry chef at Brothers and Sisters in Washington, D.C. Also on the show, I talk to Marcus Glocker, executive chef at Augustine and chef owner of Batard. But Matt, let's talk about Piché. After studying architecture at UC Berkeley, Piché Ong eventually made it to New York and worked with a chef by the name of Jean-Georges Van Gerichten from 1998 to 2004, working at the restaurant 66, shout out to Sex in the City, and the enormous spice market located in the meatpacking district. Piché Ong is a living legend. I have just recently been rewatching Sex in the City. There's so much good restaurant scenes on that show. And 66 is all over this all over it. Yeah. What were the pastries and desserts that Pichet was making at the time during this golden era of New York City restaurants? Super innovative stuff. He was taking French technique and implementing the flavors and ingredients of Southeast Asia. He was doing desserts with passion fruit and jackfruit. He was making tapioca jewels. It was all really forward looking. Also, Anna, can you imagine a world without salt and caramel? I can't. I mean, it's like in everything now. Every candy bar. Guess what? Pichet pretty much invented that shit. Wow. Here is Matt talking to Pichet. Pichet Ong, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Hello. Good morning. Hi, Matt. Hello, old friend. We we haven't seen each other in a couple of years. We've known each other for about a decade. Yes, I know. We've, I love it. We sort of grew up together in a way in New York, right? <laughs> I feel like that. I know. And I was writing about you probably in 04, 05. I, I've been such an admirer of your work, uh, but also your friendship and your just being super, like, you, you talk some shit, Piche. I do. <laughs> <laughs> We goss a lot. That's what you get when you've been around, right? <laughs> no, you're a good guy, of course. Uh, two things about your bio that I always we always like talk about. Well, we don't always talk about, but this is like two things that stuck out was you went to Berkeley to start and studied architecture. Is that right? I did. That's really cool. What was that? What, how did that role and how did that kind of affect your career path towards uh, pastry? Well, first of all, I went to school because um, I, you know I was born in Thailand uh, in the in, uh, in a Chinese family. My, my parents are strict, uh, traditional Chinese family. And, um, you know, they value education and they said, you, you can do anything you want. Scrub toilets, become a chef, become a movie star, dancer, whatever you want to be, as long as you have education. And um, I wanted to study a little bit of science, a little bit of art, a little bit of writing, and um, just general, like overall, the idea of like uh, learning context and how you can... Um, create a life or design or come up with ideas through a con- a, like a background of contextual um, concepts and architecture fit that role. And that's why I went to architecture and Berkeley. Um, but Berkeley because mostly California and I'm a little bit at that time a hippie and I thought yeah. Berkeley's perfect. Are there any architects that you that you really admire that you studied? Um, Zaha Hadid, Frank Gehry. I love ar- architect- architects that think outside the box. Um and not necessarily think of uh, something that has to do with structure because that, that to me, I soon found out was more engineering. And, um, you know, and, and now becoming a chef, I realize there's a lot of similarities because you have to work with guidelines, you know, um, you know, rules of cooking, uh, technique, uh, whatever the client wants, whatever the owner wants, whatever fits the style of the restaurant, price points, um, guest relations. I mean, it's exactly what architecture was. Um, pleasing people, um, hospitality, and making people feel happy. And also just like thinking outside the box too is I think pastry is a great, mm-hmm. and especially plated desserts, which you were well known for um, at John George, you know, that, that's out of the box yes. cooking, yes. right? I do. I, I uh, you know, working on the John George had to make me think outside the box, particularly at the time when 
um, it was still very new, right? Late 1900, uh, was it 1900? No, last century. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah the late 1990s. Right, and he, had, <laughs> and he had a string of restaurants that was kind of indescribable. Is it yeah. Thai? Is it French? Um, you know, to me, it's just good food. Um, but, you know, pulling resources that you like and making people appreciate them. Um, it's it's you and and let's uh we'll get we'll get to your time at spice market but i want the second point i had is that you're you are you are a voracious words with friends and scrabble player you are you are the best player i've ever witnessed and while you were an active cook in new york you were playing with frank bruni who was the restaurant critic and food writer at the time uh yeah did we play also how do you know this that i we... feel like we played a little bit yeah oh, we did yeah you kicked okay. my ass i did <laughs> you're start... good you're good let's, let's start again and frank bruni let's let's start again too <laughs> I thought it was just like the funniest thing. Like, oh yeah, I'm playing with Frank Bruni. I'm like, he's a critic of the paper, or was was a food writer at the time. Anyways, I love that about you. But let's talk about Spice Table. What was that like at that time? What were you doing at that restaurant? What kind of pastry were you cooking? And and really, I want to take us back to that era of New York. A lot of our guests, um, I like to go back in time and 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 talk about what New York was like during this period. Right. Well, I came to New York first in '97 uh, from straight from California. I lived in. San Francisco and Los Angeles. And um, in San Francisco, I mostly learned about, you know, respecting ingredients and cooking in a very simple way that highlights uh, flavors and seasonal ingredients. And when I went to LA, it was a little bit more of, you know, going back to pleasing the clients. At that time, it was very industry driven. And you had to do food that, you know, was accessible to, um, you know, the Hollywood crowd, which, you know, to me is very similar to New York now, which is the money crowd you know, who would like food very simple. So, um, Which has changed so dramatically. Ex- yeah, in, in very 2019 all day In both different. cities. Yeah, completely. So I came to New York and I knocked on a lot of doors and ended up at John George. Um, and let's clarify here because I actually started as uh, one of his fish cooks and um, only because I wanted to be underneath him, next to him, and, you know, learn from him. At and the flagship? At the flagship, yeah. Yeah, JG, great. And, um, you know, and, and I learned a lot and uh, also had, you know, felt like I contributed a lot. So, but when we when I left there, uh, we kind of just kept it open, and I expressed to him that I wanted something uh, in um, you know the realm of dessert only because I like it, and you know, and I was new in New York. I wanted to have a life where I could you know you know spend a whole day cooking and not smell bad after work. <laughs> so you know, like fish, the fish cooks, yeah, they yeah, really get it in smelled your skin. bad. So yeah. um, you know, after like five years of doing that, you know, different restaurants, including Tabla. Um, I decided, okay, I want to, you know, go back to pastry, which is where I started. Were the hours and, different for pastry at the time? Were you working days and having your nights off? Um, well, it's it's in general, it's always different. We work yeah. more during the day. We we do planning, organizing, and you know, usually the service is very simple for dessert. Uh, it should be that way because, um, you know, there's a lot of baking and you know having all your mise en place ready beforehand, and um, and so you know, I know that was my calling for John George because then you know I be you know I I can I you know had a lot to contribute um besides also becoming like a marquee name in the company and so we opened 66 first um but by that point we had already sketched out the idea of spice market because um you know in one of those media uh, idea uh, ideation is that yeah, yeah, idea sessions yeah we were talking about Asia, southeast asian street food and you know he's really well traveled in um that area uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Hong Kong, um, China. And so, you know, after 66, we pretty much, uh, you know, were ready to roll out Spice Market. And that really lended to your background of growing up in Thailand, I'm sure. So it was like a, clearly he was building this restaurant slightly with his staff and saw you, the work you're doing at 66, and then transitioned that to Spice Market. Yes. Um, Amazing. So, yeah, we, we uh, you know, it's something that was really natural for me, and I never thought I would... Uh, you know, go that path of like highlighting, uh, you know, my heritage in a way, um, into my work. And Spice um, Market, man, what a, what a, what a restaurant. Like, what a, is massive. It's an ha- epic opening. Epic think, restaurant. One of the first in the meat. What year district. remind us? Yeah. Well, we started looking at the site, I think, right after the turn, uh, 2000. And then after that, 2002, th- you know, we opened. Through 9-11. Yeah. You, you went through all the way. Yes. And this is well before the meatpacking district became a destination. Yes. Florent was probably open. <laughs> I know. Still. <laughs> it, it was, actually. Um, you know, Florent was, uh, towards the final days of Florent, um, it actually lost its edge a little bit then. But because the meatpacking has become... Um, 
you know, very general crowd as opposed to like, uh, you know, a clubby kind of house. Yeah, even in 20, 2002, 2003, it had made that turn. Right. Talk about some of the desserts you were doing at Spice Market and some of the the highs there and lo- maybe lows too. I don't know. Talk about whatever. Um, well, uh, you know, we, we had planned on it being sort of a, um, not a multi-unit restaurant from the start. So um, I had to make sure that there is something that's, um, you know, everybody would like, but yet pushing the envelope a little bit. So, the dessert that got me the most attention was Thai jewels, which is uh, tapioca dumplings that's uh, in coconut milk soup. Um, and in my version, I had like passion fruit and jackfruit. I introduced a lot of uh, exotic fruits at that time to uh, the New York dining scene. Um, we didn't have an ice cream machine, and so I was making ice creams by hand in an in Indian, uh, in t- uh, you know, based on two different cultures, which is China and um, India. So we had a kufi and we had a hand spun ice cream in the style of you know, you, what you would find on in, in on the streets of, of Guangzhou or Shanghai. Um, and then we put them in a Chinese takeout container. I think that was kind of fun. It was the pageantry um, of the time. And, and yeah. you know, at the time, it was really revolutionary to, to serve something in a takeout container. It was right. clever. We, we had rice pudding, which is very common throughout Southeast Asia. So pretty much the dessert stayed the same uh, during the whole time that I was there. And and then when we wrote out the concept in different cities like London or Doha, uh, the desserts, um, uh, you, you know, went with the uh, the rollout. And some of them also made it to the other um, concepts of yeah. John George, like the steakhouse in Las Vegas. So that's a pretty cool thing for me to see. Yeah, um, and your inspiration. Can I? Can, I, can we go back? Did you um, kind of invent the pairing of passion fruit and chocolate? No, I think it's. It's something that um, has been around, but I always be- am a big fan of, of um, you know, sweet uh, fruit with uh, chocolate. Uh, it's such sour a, fruit with chocolate. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. such a go-to, and even you could even say now, maybe even a cliche. But I mean, back in the day, holy shit, it was everywhere, and I feel like you were like the start of it. I think, I think it was unusual at the time. Yeah. Um, I would say maybe salted caramel is more my thing because I remember when I first served salt with um, caramel or desserts in general, people hesitated. They were like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the pastry chef used salt by mistake. I mean, and now that's everywhere, right? Completely. It's um, like a, it's a, a Starbucks uh, latte um, flavor. But I don't claim to have invented anything because we, you know, yeah. basically everything has been around it's just you interpret it in your own way and make it yours well said i agree my job as a journalist is to, is to say things like you invented and point out your 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 level and your the hierarchy of thank of, you of the take world the credit. yeah take the credit okay. from me uh but i want to also talk in the timeline might be a little bit off but you opened a restaurant called pong mm-hmm. p asterisk ong yes. really 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 influential place uh, in New York, to me, it was influential because it was the first time I ever had like a real dessert tasting where, where you're serving multiple courses of of, of sweets, of the pastry side um, in, a, in a format that was both fun but also felt structured. Tell us a bit about what that was like opening and what years and all that. All that stuff. Well, that was uh, 2006. Um, I started making plans for it. That was towards the end of Spice Market. I came up with a cookbook with Genevieve Co called The Sweet Spot. Um, what else was happening then? Um, you know, I was, uh, I guess, well-known as a New York City chef. And um, I was also approaching, um, you know, a stage in my life where I thought that I should uh, branch off on my own and do my own thing. And I thought long and hard about what I wanted to do. Um, I remember at that point, and still I still do, I love eating desserts. And I always treated it as, uh, you know, a form of food. And at the time, I don't know if everybody thought of it that way. I think everybody pretty much thought it was a kind of indulgence or uh, occasional treat um, or, or something that's just wild and, you know, something that's not part of like a daily diet. But, you know, I grew up in a culture where... Um, where you can really eat dessert at any time of the day. And in Japan and Europe, they mostly still do, you know, croissant, you know, pastries in the morning, cake in the afternoon. So I wanted to open a, uh, a dessert focused place and, um, in, in a very small jewel like box. Um, and, um, West Village, is that right? West Village yeah. on 10th Street. Yeah. So desserts were front and center because I was, um, very, you know, most people know me to be the pastry chef and, um, but then I also wanted to do food because I, I do love to eat and I want people to come for whatever reason. And um, I had a tasting menu uh, of, I believe it was like eight or ten courses uh, that has 
uh, some food and that led up to desserts. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew there was a certain crowd that was going to mm-hmm. appreciate that. And at the time, I wasn't um, uh, alone. Um, there was Sam Mason and mm-hmm. Will Goldfarb. Will Goldfarb's Room for Dessert? Room for Dessert. Amazing and, place um, too, man. Yeah, Taylor. Yeah, um, sure, Taylor. But I, I, you know, looking back and even now, like I, I um, can say that I could also <laughs> claim all the credit because there was Chickalicious before that. Um, I, I would say that my um, my take on it was that I also had food. Uh, and many of the dishes were raw because um, I didn't have a fully equipped kitchen. Um, so there was a lot of crudo, salads, uh, braised meats, uh, you know, s- things that... Uh, that small, small courses, plate. but yeah. then you would transition into the four to five dessert courses. Right. Now, let me ask you, I mean, what happened to this genre of dining? I feel like I cannot find... A taste, a dessert tasting menu in New York. Am I am I missing the boat? Well, I think part of it has to do with economics. I think uh, you know, I opened in t- two thousand six. By the time two thousand eight rolled around, the, there was that economy, uh, you know, crash, and it really affected us all. I mean, desserts were uh, driven. Restaurant were were one of the uh, genre of restaurants to have been cut out, and um, also learning from the, the, the experience that I actually needed. A partnership of sorts that had to do with a restaurant to to make the business model work. Um, I opened up a bakery right next door to Pong called Batch that um, uh, right in two thousand eight actually that uh, uh, was unable. To, it was actually doing really well, but it, it wasn't able to sustain itself because of the uh, the tanking the of the restaurant. The headwinds, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was just extreme. It was out of control, and yeah. personally, I was going through a lot. Um, I had a divorce and my mom had a stroke. It was just a lot of stuff coming down at once. And I decided to just walk away at, by that point. And um, I wouldn't say uh, that, you know, fast forward um, a decade later, I don't, I wouldn't say that it's gone. It's just re, re uh, you know, adjusted its, its, uh, the way it's served. Because you can go to Jungshik for dessert tasting, uh, Hua Ban, which I did recently, which is terrific. Um, so many of the dessert tastings are associated with a restaurant, but also many pastry chefs have morphed into this, um, uh, uh, you know, type of business model that actually has a cafe like this, you know, Chanson, which also has a dessert bar in the basement. But if you look across country, you see a lot of these new type of restaurants that open up by pastry chefs in Los Angeles. There's friends and family, Fiona, um, uh, Willa Jean in New Orleans. Uh, there's many types of restaurants that are founded by pastry chef with a strong uh, uh, food service. As so you well. could order at some of those places. I know Fiona, you can order as, uh, many desserts and have yes. them all thrown out on your table and have yes. a really fun time. You've been? Uh, I've met Nicole and I've had her. She's been uh-huh. on the podcast. Uh, I've been. Oh, it's great. I mean, it's great <laughs> stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I haven't been to the restaurant, but she brought some pastries to our interview. Um but 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 I just like I like the idea of going and paying like fifty sixty dollars and just having five desserts or eighty dollars and having eight desserts by yourself or on a date. Well, with friends, yeah, okay. yeah, with my wife or with friends, or I think we would have a hell of a time. I think it seems like someone should do that. Maybe not in New York because no one should do anything in New York right now, right? It's kind of a crazy. <laughs> it's place. It's tough here, yeah. But yeah. I think it's you know it's it's it goes through phases, right? Sure. Because. You know, I think right now, I think New York is uh, is real estate makes it very hard it's tough. for anyone to do any business. And you're spending a lot of time in Washington, D.C. We'll get to that. Okay. But I wanted to, after Pong and Batch, you ended up for the past decade, a lot of your work was in consulting. And you've been prolific and you've worked with so many cool chefs and young upstarts and establishment. Tell us a little bit about what that entails. What is um, a, a, a pastry or just a restaurant consulting chef? What do you do? Um, actually, that, that part of my career f- pretty much fell on my lap after Pong closed. Um, you know, a lot of people came up to me and, you know, wondered what I was going to do next. And, um, I pretty much chose, uh, you know, the direction of like just doing many types of different things and, you know, see what sticks, you know. Um, and I worked with Hagendas to develop new ice cream flavors. I worked really, with- what did you invent? Tell us one. What's the flavor you invented? Well, there was five, and then there was um, oh, low key. There's five that you invented. What? Give me one. No, no, five. The the this the you know the five ingredient ice cream. Oh, thing I see. I thought you said you invented five launched. flavors. Um, well, there was passion fruit, obviously, Mary lemon. You know, something that's a little bit more esoteric, yeah. which I thought farm to table was the way to go. And then yeah, you know nice. there was some kind of cake in. 
cake ice cream, which I thought was going to be interesting. A lot of it had to do with marketing because, um, you know, it's a very established uh, brand and um, very famous for vanilla strawberry chocolate. And you have your rum raisin. The best strawberry out there. Yeah, it's great. And, um, And so they were looking for ways to, you know, at that time it was everybody was doing crazy ice cream, you know. Jenny was born, right? Jenny's ice cream. And, um, you know, it, it was a, from a marketing perspective, it's great for them to uh, innovate. Uh, I get that. And they're not the only company. Every much, Pretty much everyone did. Um, you know, Kit Kat, the bar, uh, launched many crazy flavors. Um, so I worked for uh, General Mills at that time. Um, I opened Coppelia. I, I still did restaurant work. So um, opened Coppelia, opened Spot Dessert Bar, um, Which is spot? Are there are spots around still? I, I, there's several. That's uh, what I thought. Flushing. I mean, yeah, uh, I'm no longer a, uh, a partner in that, but uh, it's, it's flourishing. Really good. So stuff there, it, yeah. that's one place you go to for desserts. Yeah, you're right. Um, that's a good call. Yeah. My favorite one was Village Tart, um, because Village I thought tart. that um, yeah, so good, so good. Um, and and you know it's Pas- uh, what is there now? Pascual Jones. Yeah. Right. So I I thought the neighborhood was great. I went to that with Leslie Bernard and Pat Sir. Um, I don't know what happened there in the end, in retrospect, but um, those are some I, names, Leslie and Pat. Yeah, ba- throwback, right? <laughs> um, and um, you know, everyone's moved on now. Um, yeah. but uh, restaurants. So you know, I went back to John George to do some more work for him. Um, I feel really blessed actually because I'm surrounded by people who um who uh you know want to work with me again. And so the next ten years, I I I was really busy as a consultant um, traveling a lot traveling and a lot you love yeah. to travel just for fun we'll get to that but tell you you were traveling you're in austin i know a lot doing some work down there i did some work in austin too and uh, california um but my favorite has got to be asia i've you know since since my dad got older um is in the 90s now and i always wanted to um fly back to thailand or or china or japan or hong kong to to take on projects because after that i can spend some time with him and get you know, get a, my trip paid for, which is great. And so I was co- concentrating on that. That kept me out of the country and traveling for a while and exploring and realizing that life is short, that I want to see more. And uh, that kind of link, got linked to my Instagram. And I'm always traveling and people don't think that I actually work no, you've because got I'm an, always in a different country. No, you've got an amazing Instagram. What's the, what is it? Just your name? It's just my name. Yeah, Pichai Ong. Um, but it, it is a really great Instagram for world travel, but you are obviously working and you've grown a following there. Yes. People love you on the gram. Well, that's a fascinating post. And, you know, it's fascinating to see the life of a chef, what it can be in a way. But don't believe it. It's not always true that it's I'm not. You, there, there where, when I post. But also you are just the most voracious restaurant goer. I, I've, I've spent time with you in Austin and L.A. and some other cities. And we have hit up more restaurants per day than anyone ever I've, I've, I've dined with. I mean, you could hit up five restaurants. No way. In really? Eight, we've hit up like eight restaurants before, I feel, you and I. You must have done ten with Dookie. Well, Dookie and I used to do a lot, but you used to, no. But tell us, like, what what do you like to like? What, tell us a little bit about that method because I just think it's really fun. Fascinating. Well, first of all, I'm in the industry because I love to eat. That was my main reason for going to the restaurant industry, like from the get go. Um, when I first started cooking, you know, um, I remember I was working at very f- nice restaurants, Stafoli, Japanese in San Francisco area, and you know, going to restaurant and you know they put you know, that title, you know, work where you're working next to your reservation and you get like free desserts, you know, it's great. Um, you know, it's that, that, that tradition of restaurant treating other industry members is still going strong. Um, and it feels really nice, you know? And, um, so I, I do love to eat out a lot. Um, I mean, a restaurant, a, a town like Los Angeles is perfect because it's, you know, you want a taco, you want sushi, you want something that's Californian pizza, right? And you want to cram it all into like uh, one day. You so, want to eat um, there, yeah. you do. So you kind of create your own tasting menu, you know. It's- but you're heading to China soon. I, I, I think you told me. So when you go to China, how are you thinking about restaurants? Because you also love to hit up like five places in a day when you're in like Beijing, right? It, it, it depends on the city. In a place like Beijing or Shanghai, you could do it. Um, this time, I'm actually going to some place uh, to to Xi'an, which I've never been to before. Oh, Xi'an! Cool. Yeah, so I think it's going to be a bit more cultural trip this time. It's with my dad, and he he wants to see history. Um, yeah. You know, uh, we're both like fascinated with China and history and and um, you know our heritage. In yeah, a way. that's so, oh, what a I cool think, trip! Yeah, it's nice. 
Okay, so let's move forward to the present. Um, and you're spending a lot of time in Washington, D.C. You're working with one of my favorite chefs and, and just dudes in general, Eric Bruner Yang at his restaurant, Brothers and Sisters. Talk about hooking up with Eric Bruner Yang and what you're doing there. Well, I first, uh, you know, chose the path of going down to, uh, actually, I live in Virginia um, because I met, I was dating um, J- Jason here in New York, and when he moved down for his job, he works for the government. And we moved down, I moved down with him and start, start to explore the area. And that happened at the time when Eric was growing Maketo and signing a deal with the Sidel Group to open the Line Hotel, two restaurants at the Line Hotel. And, um, you know, by this point, Eric was able to um, basically afford me <laughs> to be his uh, corp uh, pastry director. And so, um, by, you know, by that point, Eric and I have been um, friends that had a little bit of, you know, he would say mentorship kind of involved. But to me, you know, I've been around for a while and I wanted to look for a situation where it's almost like family-like kind of um you know, environment because you know we meet a lot of people in industry and relationships develop, and some ends and some don't uh, last. You know, beyond the work, and if, to me that's important because it's not about just the work because it's about you know life and relationship building that's that's um, long lasting. And I knew that I was going to have that with Eric even beyond the work because work ends at the end of the well, day. Well, it's on the the title of the restaurant is Brothers and Sisters. Yes. It just says it all there. So tell tell us a little bit about the, what you're what you're doing at that restaurant. I don't really know too much. I've never I've never been there. I'd like to check it out sometime. So Brothers and Sisters is a lobby uh the the restaurant uh, is located in the lobby and um when we discussed in the beginning uh, Eric wanted to um you know he's also a, another traveler and he goes to um, his homeland, Taiwan and China and Asia in general, quite a bit. And he wanted to to create uh, an American menu that you might find in, um, let's say, Hong Kong or Taipei. You know, there's, a, there's something for everyone. There's a Caesar salad and, uh, you know, steak, burger, pork chop, uh, something, you know, a little Asian, but mostly an American menu that draws inspiration from, uh, you know, different types of cuisine around the world. And then... Centering around that is uh, an all-day um, program where you serve cakes and um, high tea. Although I don't really call it high tea. I just call it afternoon tea because high tea has this like, yeah, you know, frou-frou sounding yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so you can come to the hotel for any reason at any time of the day for one of my cakes. So that's the majority of what I do at the hotel. And then there's uh, spoken English, which is a stand-up, uh, not stand-up, standing room. Um, Izakaya Tachinomiya style restaurant, uh, where we serve some yakitori skewers, um, doing uh, fermented durian curry, um, oh, Peking duck. You can come for any of these options, uh, and of course, lots and lots of drinks, soju, sake. Yeah, so Izakaya style. Whatnot. Yeah, it's great. And I also have desserts there. One of the desserts come with the Peking duck menu, um, and then the other two desserts are always rotating um, seasonally. I think it's a great restaurant for me to do seasonal things that's whimsical and with a funny presentation that I'm known for. So you, you, you spent some time in California, but you're, you spent a lot of time in New York and you're, you're more, you're, you recently moved to DC. What's it like running a restaurant in Washington, DC? I just have like, well, or I just have this like horrible image of like governmental people and politics and just not cool people. Sorry, DC listeners. I'm just being honest. Well, truth be told, I um, I left uh, New York. Up, you know, besides dating someone and working with Eric Bruner Yang, I you know, it was this same same environment for me here. Uh, the grind of um, money and uh, economy. It's it really brings uh, people uh, up and down. Um, a lot of downs. Obviously, that's why I chose to uh, try check out uh, DC. I find it to be very similar in that in rather than money or you know economy it becomes politics. I chose a very strange time to go. Um <laughs> yeah, because think? yeah. <laughs> um you know with the uh, the administration. Uh, yeah, administration it's 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 odd. I feel the atmosphere is odd. Um I live in Virginia which is um you know a little bit more iffy, but DC itself it's uh, is uh, 97% you know democratic and I think it's it's a different vibe. It's so, for sure, and I and I'm teasing about my hate for DC because yeah, it's a pretty great city once you're in the city, and not yes. on the hill. 
Have you had AOC come into your restaurant yet? Um, not yet, but uh, I mean, I would love to meet her. Um, I think that she's welcome to come anytime for cake. I mean, who doesn't want cake at the end of a, a long day, a long legislation session, right? Who ne- You need a little cake in your life. Right? Yes, it would make you feel better. It, we, as Bon Appetit says, it's like the ultimate therapy. It, it's true. I think, I, I mean, a lot of people cake say that. Cake for coping. Cake for coping. We ask all of our guests on the Taste Podcast if you were to um, be able to write your dream cookbook project without like budget or any, you know, deadlines in mind. Just, just what, what would be your dream cookbook project, Piche? I'm actually trying to sell a cookbook now. It's um, called Coconuts. It's about... Um, Coconuts. Yeah, I'm surprised it doesn't exist yet. I did some research. Um, I I started talking about with Andrea Nguyen from um, yeah. California about this Great book. Great cookbook author, yeah. Right, and um, it's about coconuts because, you know, it's a way of life for... Um, a, a large chunk of the population of the world. And um, I mean, I, right now, I think it's hit on, hitting on many um, interest groups, you know, from um, vegan, uh, you know, gluten-free with using the coconut flour. But I think there's a whole, um, you know, like Asian desserts of, for, you know, for, uh, uh, nine, you know, 2002, when I wrote uh, The Sweet Spot, there's a whole lot of mystery surrounding um, that that genre. But Ironically, it's a very mainstream ingredient that you find everywhere. Throughout Everyone's drinking coconut water here. Coconut um, oil. Coconut oil. Um, but we just don't know how it's harvested, where it comes from, uh, what are the uh, nutri- you know, nutrition, and what you could actually use for it. You know? um, so I thought of um, doing that. Um, I think you're going to write this. I feel Random like this House is a interested? good idea. <laughs> are <Yeah>. you interested? <laughs> Hey, man, if I, if I could buy cookbooks, I would buy that one. I okay, love that. let me get the proposal in my back. <laughs> Piché, thank I you for... I ready. <laughs> Piché, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Thank you. Here's Anna speaking with Marcus Glocker. Welcome to the Taste Podcast, Marcus. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You are from Austria, and a lot of your cooking kind of is right in the crossover between French and Austrian cooking. What is the crossover there? What are the similarities between those two cuisines? I mean, I think it's a very uh, old world type of cooking, I would say. Um, And I did my apprenticeship in Austria, in Linz, and then I moved sort of to Vienna, moved to Munich, and I never actually worked in Paris, but I sort of always had worked in French driven uh, kitchens and so I, I made sort of my own style of, of cooking up a little bit I would say which is definitely a Viennese type of cooking with uh, French techniques together and that's uh, what you can experience at the moment at Augustine. What exactly is Viennese cooking like and how is it different from the rest of Austria because when I think of Austria I think of strudel I think of spetzel but what are the really distinct Viennese flavors and I mean, in, Aust- in, in Austria, it's, it's a very regional cooking, so um, every uh, part of Austria has sort of their own version of, of doing even a similar dish, what uh, you can experience in Vienna, but, you know, you're going to go to the Alps, it's a little bit differently uh, prepared. But uh, the Venice uh, uh, cuisine is actually one of the oldest cuisines, and so they are very uh, rooted in the traditional cooking, uh, which uh, sometimes gets uh, forgotten a little bit, I would say, uh, especially in the younger generation with uh, everybody wants to be a creative and uh, uh, wants to use these recipes and tweak them and uh, make them more modern. But for me, to go back to Vienna and have an old school uh, Tafelspitz, for example, or a strudel, which is made the original way, it's something very unique. I didn't realize that when I lived there, but now I'm over 10 years in New York City and uh, looking back and uh, experience that food um, it's very special. I recently got to eat some of your food at a dinner at the James Beard House, which was really fun. And you talked about seeking inspiration from some historic recipes um, from 100 or more years ago. What is the process like of kind of excavating those recipes and making them modern again? Where do you find these really old dishes? I mean, the old is new again. It's it's so old that nobody does it. So it's the, probably the, the the newest thing right now for a lot of chefs to cook those old recipes because nobody does it anymore. Um, specifically for this dinner, which was the theme of uh, Paris meets Vienna, um, I think, for example, the conversation tart, which is one of the oldest recipes, actually, um, I think all of my cooks looked at me like, 
where is this from? What are we doing? <laughs> so my pastry chef there, um, Emiko, was like playing around with this uh, for approximately like two or two and a half weeks. It's basically just one little tart, and I think you, you tasted it, which has a little puff pastry, French Japan, uh, marmalade, and then on top is royal icing. But the key is you have to cook everything or bake everything together in one shot. So you have to figure out that the inside is uh, soft, the dough is crispy, and the icing is not overcooked. So it's a very interesting, it's a very simple flavor, but to uh, uh, get it right takes a lot of a lot of practice. The icing actually bakes on the tart? Yes. So you have to bake everything together. So when you eat that, the middle has to be soft and chewy, mm-hmm. and the outside has to be crispy. So we baked it so many times that we figure out the exact timing for this uh, dish. And this recipe is so old. Can you imagine how many people worked on this back in the time to make mm-hmm. this uh, uh, perfect? So that was sort of the, the inspiration for me to get those recipes together with Viennese cuisine as well, because conversation tart is obviously an old school French recipe. And Were they called conversation, conversation tarts? Conversation tart, yeah. Do you and, have any uh, idea where that name came from? It's great. It's, it's, a, it's a long history. You should Google it. It's, it's very interesting, actually. Uh, got created for, for an event. Uh, they wanted to publish a book, and this was the dish or the tart they served for this, uh, 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 I, would, I would say, uh, for this party back in the time. And it opened conversations. That's what, what the original uh, uh, idea of this dish was. And the first time I experienced this dish was actually in London when I worked for Gordon Ramsay back in the time. And we had this on a bump on trolley. And uh, I forgot about it, but I still had a, a similar recipe in my pocket. <laughs> I started Augustine and I thought, like, this is a great uh, uh, tart to bring back. So did you have to tweak anything in from that original conversation tart recipe to make it work with today's ingredients and today's, you know, ovens Absolutely. and equipment, what what had to change? I mean, we had to figure out the time and temperature for, for the baking process, obviously. Because a lot of old recipes don't even say a temperature. Exactly. It was it's like, before you, know, you had a thermometer in your oven. Now it's, everything is so detailed in every, every recipe. And back in the time, it was like the chefs were just uh, figuring it out themselves. And when you really look at it, uh, you have four ingredients or five ingredients there. And it still took us quite a while to figure out the perfect uh, time and temperature to make this uh, happen. So that's sort of an exciting thing. It's not always about being uh, creative. It's sometimes getting as close as possible to the original recipe. And that's exciting, too. You have a little bit of a background in pastry. Is that right? I used to work. I wouldn't call myself a pastry person, but uh, I know the basics in pastry. I, I know what I like in pastry. I love sweets. I'm a, uh, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for that, I would say. <laughs> but um, um, I know the traditional techniques. And in, in Europe, when you do an apprenticeship in a kitchen, um, the savory and pastry is always some sort of uh, together. So you have to spend uh, time in pastry to understand the basics, which really helped me uh, in, in, in the process of like running a kitchen as well, because you can point out certain things in pastry, what you like to have. Uh, versus you have no idea what's going on there. So that's sort of, it has to be cohesive, it has to be together. And for me personally, I like to use uh, pastry and savory elements as well. So they always should work together. How, what is your creative process like with your pastry chefs at Augustine and Batard? Is it sort of like a back and forth? You know, it looks like sometimes you provide the ideas or the original recipes. Absolutely. What is, what is that creative interplay like? I mean, first of all, I, I try to, when I go into the kitchen, I always try to have a goal of the day. The goal of the day is maybe it's a new dish or maybe it's addressing uh, something in the, in, the, uh, in the kitchen, which I saw maybe the day before when we did service. And, you know, it's just small little things, but it's every day something. And every day there's a creative process for me as well. When I have an idea, I will plant the seed. And to plant the seed is for me going over to pastry, tell them what's going on. This is the conversation that look it up, study it, what's going on there. And then uh, uh, normally they will come back to me and uh, present me their version of the conversation that, and then I will give them a feedback, and it's a back and forth. But it's not, it's rarely that I, I just give somebody a recipe and say, like, this is exactly what I want to have. I want to have a little bit more than that. I want to have your version or our version and, and make it more exciting. You just started at Augustine this past September, is that right? Correct, yeah. What are the things that you're cooking now at Augustine that you weren't able to do at Batard until until now? I mean, I, I would say I, I, I could be able to cook in, in each kitchen the same dishes, but for me it was like just uh, to 
give you a little background about Augustine. I mean, 2010, I looked first time at this uh, building, actually. There was no Augustine. There was no Tom Colicchi or Beekman Hotel. Um, I looked at the space, and I was intrigued by the building because it was empty for so many years. And obviously, it was not in the in the stage of, like, taking on a new restaurant. But when I got the opportunity from Keith McNally to uh, uh, step into this kitchen, it's not about my concept, what I wanted to do. I looked at the space, and the space for me was Paris meets Vienna. And for me, it was a casual every day, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, spot. So that's how I started creating the menu there. And it's definitely very different to Batard. I mean, Batard is doing six nights a week, dinner service only. Um, we have a smaller restaurant, and yeah, it's a little bit more refined. It's a little bit more wine-driven. Um, and Augustine is sort of a, a more relaxed, everyday uh, restaurant. I want to talk about Spetzel, one of my favorite foods. And we talked about it a few weeks ago because I wrote about Spetzel for taste. Yeah. You serve a buttermilk chive Spetzel at Augustine um, that you talked about sort of being inspired by days in childhood, like a long day of skiing and then just hunkering down for some Spetzel after that. Tell me, tell me about Spetzel. Why is it fun for a chef to make? Why is it versatile? Why is it great? I mean, it's it's just such a, as you mentioned this correctly, it's a very forgiving pasta, I would say almost. And it's a quick recipe. You, you can make it refined. You can make it very casual. You have so many different options to, to work with Spetzel. And um, where I grew up, my family has a hotel back home. So it's a little bit on the mountain. There's not many things around, a few cows and mountains. But, you know, when you come home after skiing and have a, a, a big bowl of spätzle with cheese and, and, and onions, I mean, it's it's something uh, very comforting. And that's what I like about this uh, dish. Same way as pasta. It's very comforting. It's always delicious. And you have endless possibilities to work with. One of the things I realized while researching it is that there are, like, a million different ways of making it. There's, of course, like, the traditional grandmother way of kind of heaping some dough onto a little wooden board and then just chopping it directly into the boiling water. Yes, yes. How How many different ways have you tried making it, and how did you land on the technique that you use at Augustine? Again, it's rooted in, 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 in a lot of history, uh, Spätzle, and for the Germans, uh, Schwabenland, it's called, actually, uh, where Spätzle are hand uh, cut, which means, as you described just now, with a cutting board, you have a spatula, and it's sort of fine noodles going directly into the water. Uh, that's the way of doing Spätzle in Germany. And in Austria, you pass it through a Spätzle press, it's called, or I use a perforated hotel pan with little holes mm -hmm. and just let the dough uh, slide through it so you have little sort of uh, connells uh, directly going into the water. But again, this is more about the history of where the Spätzle are made. Uh, that's sort of the technique. What is something that you're cooking right now on the menu at Batard or Augustine that you're really excited about that's kind of new that you're trying out? I mean, at Augustine, I, I, we were just trying to get ready for spring. And what I'm very excited about is I always loved in Vienna when I, when I in the afternoon, to go to a coffee place and have a beautiful coffee and, and a freshly baked cake. And that's sort of like the version of Vienna's high tea, I would almost say. Mm -hmm. And I would like to bring something like this to Augustine where you have in the afternoon the possibility to go in there, have a cu cup of coffee, have uh, maybe a glass of champagne and then a freshly baked uh, a fruit cake or, or whatever is in season, which we try to get uh, Union Square Markets involved in that and have those uh, daily changing, you know, and you just come in for a quick uh, cake and uh, coffee and maybe a glass of champagne. And that's sort of uh, an exciting process right now because we're trying to figure out all these uh, recipes and cake recipes and torts, uh, classic torts as well, for this uh, promotion. I love that every culture seems to have kind of like their own version of that. Like the Scandinavian fika is just a break in the afternoon to have a little sweet, some coffee. It's great. It's absolutely comforting. It's 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 great. And you know, on a Friday when you uh, get out of work a little bit early and have in the afternoon a little coffee and cake, maybe a little charcuterie, and uh, call it the weekend. Love that, Marcus. Thank you so much for coming on the Taste Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>